opening up on global business, the China Import and Export Fair, which is seen as barometer of China's foreign trade, is underway in Guangzhou, attracting buyers from over 200 countries in the region. In our special series, Biz Focus, we look at how offline shopping is regaining its momentum in China. And China's housing market continued to recover in March, driven by pent-up demand from the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as policy incentives. Hello and welcome to this edition of Global Business on CGTN. I'm Guan Xing in Beijing. And first up on the program, violent clashes between the Sudanese military and rapid support forces paramilitary group, which erupted over the weekend, have claimed nearly 100 civilian lives. The Sudanese Doctors' Union says many more have been wounded. And Naba Mohidin has more. The situation is still fragile and the humanitarian situation is really bad. A lot of people are stuck in their homes, a lot of people are stuck in their schools and universities with no food or water for more than two days. Um, the UN appealed for the two sides to open a uh, humanitarian passage to allow citizens to move. So people moved, but it was also risky and some victims uh, also were killed during the ceasefire. The situation is still bad on ground, despite that there is some signs of relief with the military releasing a press release this morning saying they would welcome a uh, talk and uh, they, don't, they did not say it in the release, but it was signs of relief by saying they can uh, talk to RSF and sit into one table. Actually, Egypt and South Sudan, uh, they offered uh, mediation efforts and, to and talks between the two warring sides. And also Arab League, they said uh, they are offering a mediation um, initiative uh, to end this crisis. African Union and IGAD also are offering the same initiative because we know how important Sudan is strategically and geographically for uh, that for African countries because it shares borders with a lot of African countries and its migration hubs for millions of people who live in Sudan. So yes, they said they would come, but nobody knows when is it. As the conflict in Sudan continues to escalate, Chinese enterprises operating in a country are facing challenges in ensuring the safety of their projects and equipment. To get more information about the situation on the ground, CGTN spoke to an employee of a Chinese engineering company operating in Sudan, Wang Yajun, Vice General Manager of China Friendship Development, International Engineering Design and Consultation, and an employee of China Railway Construction. Take a listen. 在这个冲突爆发的时候，我们分公司正在。When the conflict commenced, our branch in Sudan was preparing to start maintenance work for the Sudan Railway. Due to the conflict, we had to halt all production and business activities. Due to the constant fighting and the sound of machine guns outside, we had to remain inside the office to ensure our personal safety. Despite the conflict. The Chinese embassy in Sudan and the state-owned Assad Supervision and Administration Commission organized an online meeting with Chinese enterprises in Sudan and urged them to share all possible information and offer timely assistance. Our headquarters in China immediately launched an emergency response plan and set up an emergency command center. We also set up an emergency response team overseas to put all personnel on full alert, strengthen security, and stay away from conflict sites to ensure the safety of employees. At the same time, we have also been paying great attention to ensure the psychological stability of our employees so that each of them can contact their own families about their safety and stay in constant communication. The Sudanese government has also provided protection and assistance to local Chinese enterprises. For example, on the April 15th, when the road was blocked on our way back to Khartoum, where the fighting has been very intense, the local embassy accompanied our employees back to our base branch safely, while the army extended protection and assistance to us, besides comforting us at this critical moment.
And after a look at the 133rd China Import and Export Fair, also known as the Canton Fair, which is underway in the southern city of Guangzhou, drawing buyers from over 220 countries and regions. For the first time in three years, offline exhibitions are back. As the largest in its history, the exhibition area is record 1.5 million square meters, with over 35,000 offline exhibitors and 40,000 online participants. The fair also attracted over 350,000 visitors on the first day. According to the China Foreign Trade Center, the Canton Fair has accumulated export transactions amounting to 1.5 trillion U.S. dollars during the 67 years since its inception and played a unique role in promoting economic and trade relations between China and the world. Staying with the Canton Fair, according to statistics from the organizer, on Saturday nearly 370,000 visitors attended the Canton Fair. Our Aaron Liu spoke to some foreign exhibitors. Take a listen. As China's largest trade fair, it has become a reliable reometer of the country's foreign trade. A total of 3 million new products are being displayed for global and domestic buyers this year. Some businesses at the fair say they expect the market will continue growing. Uh, Canton Fair is considered uh, one of the main platforms now uh, to open new markets, to, uh, to meet with uh, existing clients. So it is, uh, I consider it always as a meeting point. There are a lot of uh, players at the even the, the, the structure and the, the, the way the products are exposed uh, as well the opportunity to, to catch up with, uh, with people and with experts of different uh, businesses. Uh, it's, it's amazing. Everyone from everywhere uh, is coming to here. So it's a good uh, opportunity for other countries as we are coming from Turkey to meet with everyone, with the new one and with the, our current uh, customers. So this is my first time exhibiting in Canton Fair. And it's a very good feeling because uh, it's a proud moment and many people come here as well. It's a global point of view where traders and suppliers meet. So I'm very happy, very proud at the same time. This is the third day. So I hope the other two days also go very good. Buyers from over 200 countries are participating at the 133rd Canton Fair. They range from small to medium-sized companies to Fortune 500 enterprises. Our reporter Cao Shufeng spoke to some of the international buyers. Thousands of people gather at the Canton Fair's venue every day. Among them are buyers from all around the world looking for potential suppliers. Jorge Valencia from Mexico is one of them. He's not only a buyer himself, organizing buyer groups is also a business for his company. And he's brought 58 Mexican entrepreneurs with him to this session. And we bring uh, uh, Mexican entrepreneurs interested in many different industries, looking for different products and providers from China. Visiting the Canton Fair on a regular basis is quite common for buyers here. You get a badge like this for every session you attend. And on Enwar Wire's lanyard, a buyer from the UAE, you could find badges that were issued more than 10 years ago. All suppliers are in one place and uh, easier for us to find what, we are, what supplier we need for our business. So that's why we, we came here. The 133rd session has fully resumed after mostly focusing only on online activities for the past three years due to the pandemic. A change the buyers have applauded. Well, we participate offline, but uh, it's very different that being here in presence with you and all, all the people face to face, dealing face to face. Because we depend on China like 90 to 95 percent for uh, suppliers, so effect too much. And we are happy it's finished and we're back to China. Yeah. To buyers, the Canton Fair is also a window to glimpse the changes in Chinese products and industries every year. Every year we find many new things, many new technologies, incredible. For example, the electric cars that we have seen now. Every year we're surprised by the, uh, all uh, what's happening. Uh, big uh, change. 
This hall has been mostly empty for the past three years, but now it's full of people. Most of the international buyers I talked to at the event said they are just happy to be back, not only at the Canton Fair, but also back conducting business negotiations with Chinese companies. Cao Chufu, CGTN, Guangzhou. Starting this Monday, CGTN brings you a new series called Biz Focus. Our anchors and reporters in Beijing and around China would take a closer and deeper look at some of the most dynamic business sectors in China. And they will also talk to experts for more insights on the latest developments and trends. And today, my colleague Zheng Junfeng brings us the first episode of the series focused on the recovery in China's offline consumption. Biz Focus, feeling China's economic pulse. I'm Zheng Junfeng. For shopping in Beijing, the most fashionable place to go is probably San Litun. A long queue outside of a bakery catches my eyes. I take the queue but quickly give up. But these two young ladies apparently think differently. This gentleman in a Burberry coat has shown some purchasing power. These two gentlemen look excited to be here, and they turned out to be employees of Beijing Universal Resort, where they say customers are also coming back to. I mean, things in China have opened up later than in England and America, for sure. Um, but yeah, no, it's busy. Lots of people want to come and buy things and shop. So yeah, it's great. I feel like the economy is booming. These two girls say they visit San Luton often and have seen a steady increase of people since January. But they understand that recovery cannot happen overnight. Now it's time for me to do some shopping myself. It's something I miss badly. Here says the shopping crowd has returned, especially during holidays. But maybe San Lintun is too much of a well known sport to fully gauge shopping trends. I decide to visit a community fruit shop to get a sense of what everyday people are doing. Of course you can order online and have all these fruits delivered to your house, but it feels so different to be in an actual shop and see all these nice colors and smell the fragrance and have uh, actually taste something in your mouth. It feels like the passion of life and makes you want to just buy more. The manager here says community shops are the most sensitive to consumer behavior. To get a clear picture of the offline shopping recovery in China, trends in Beijing city alone is not enough. Our Zheng Junfeng also traveled to Hainan, the tropical island that is fast becoming a world-class shopping haven with an ambitious free trade port plan in the making. Biz Focus, feeling China's economic pause, I'm Zheng Junfeng at Wanning, Hainan province, where the Wang Fuji International Duty-Free Harbor City is officially open on April 9th. And you can see already customers are in the tens of thousands. Cosmetics, perfumes, jewelries, alcohol, you name it, 
Over 500 brands offer fine products to tourists from all over the country, all duty free. The general manager here says brick and motor shopping is no longer just about buying goods. Services, social networking, dining and other activities are also important experiences to lure customers to shop offline. 所以免税业一直被看作消费市场活力的一个情与表，我相信呢，那现在在整个免税整体行业的表现，也都代表了整个中国大的消费市场的这个复苏的迹象。Hainan is transforming into a free trade port with zero tariffs to most imported goods by 2025. The move is expected to make Hainan the world's largest duty-free market in the next few years offering unlimited opportunities for international brands.那从品牌品牌角度来讲，他们一方面呢是更希望非常看好离岛免税这个市场，希望能够继续做大离岛免税。但是从供应链的体系，他们也更加在着眼于如何建立自己在海南的一些供应链的体系，更加适应未
up 45% on a monthly basis and 30% on a yearly basis. During the first three months of this year, pre-owned home sales stood at 45,000 units, up 49% on a quarterly basis and 23% on a yearly basis. Pre-owned home sales also rose 40% from the same period in 2019. Prices of pre-owned homes rose by 1.2% on a monthly basis in the first quarter and 3.6% on year. If the monthly sales volume surpasses 20,000, the market is relatively hot. One reason is that the market was severely impacted by the pandemic last November and December, and the suppressed demand was released over the past three months. Another is the seasonal reason. There will always be a rise in sales after the spring festival. Zhao says, although there are lower interest mortgage rates and some other measures to spur the market, Beijing still has relatively strict rules to curb speculation in housing sales. As for prospects for the rest of the year, she says the market needs to be observed further to see if more favorable policies are needed, like targeted rules to boost the market in some areas with the addition of more new homes. Zhao says the other trend in the housing market is purchases for better housing outweighing the first-time purchases and accounting for 6 percent of the total. This has resulted in more apartments being sold in the three- to four-bedroom category. During a weekend in February, three four-bedroom apartments were sold, with the average price of each being about 36 million yuan. She says many people are now selling their old homes to buy ones with more facilities in relatively new buildings or selling small homes of the whole family to collectively buy a bigger one where a young couple with kids can live with their parents. This community with buildings built after 2010 has become one of the favorites. Experts say rising demand for better housing will spur purchases in downstream industries like home decoration, furniture and home appliances. A steady recovery of these sectors is expected to boost the overall recovery of the Chinese economy, considering that the entire real estate sector and the related industries accounted for about 13 percent of China's GDP last year. Song Yaotian, CGTM. The CEO of the global leading commercial real estate services company JLL says the company has benefited from China's accelerated infrastructure construction and will continue to expand in the China market. And our Yu Boquan sat down with the head of the company. Take a listen. China has been, before the pandemic hit the world, our most important growth opportunity around the world. And we are now very optimistic that we are picking up on that again and that we can show really strong growth in our Chinese business. We have a very strong presence here with more than 20,000 employees working for JLL and we are eager to expand that in the coming years. Delighted to be here. I had to wait a long time until I could come back to China and this is a very, very important market for us, so I was keen to come here. Well, this is the first time that you come to China after the COVID period. The pandemic has significantly changed people's way of working. So how will that impact the use of office and the demand on office space? I think that the question around the return to work is slightly overstated on a global level. In China, we have seen people be eager to come back into the office as early as they could. Uh, hybrid work is still, it will stay, but uh, people will want to come back to the office. The office is the place for collaboration, for innovation, uh, for really enjoying the brand of your company and, and the purpose of your company. And I think office buildings will create environments which will support that uh, element of innovation ex experience. And so office buildings have to adapt to that need. I also want to touch on the China market, because China has issued a slew of policies to support the property sectors, including expanding its public real estate investment trust, also known as REITs. So what does it mean for companies like JLL? Well, I think it is important that you have uh, an opportunity to create a very 
professional ownership of properties. And, and REITs are in mature markets um, a very professional ownership. And that is not only helping to professionalize the experience for the users of that buildings, but it's also a great um, exit for developers. Uh, infrastructure is an absolute prerequisite for a successful economy, especially an economy which is based on, on, on innovation, on services, on collaboration. You need to be able to come around, get around, travel, and the infrastructure in China is just absolutely remarkable and, 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 and more advanced than pretty much in every other country around the world. And, and that is extremely helpful for the Chinese economy, but it's also very helpful for us. That is one of the reasons why we have grown here so significantly since we first started an office in China 50 years ago, precisely. Moving on to some other headlines that we're tracking at this hour. European stocks opened cautiously higher on Monday ahead of U.S. earnings season and data from China on how the world's second largest economy is recovering. Some leading U.S. banks have released better than expected first quarter earnings reports, helping to buoy sentiments in markets whipped around last month by turmoil in the banking sector. In Tesla's first quarter, margins are anticipated to have hit a more than three-year low as the electric vehicle maker slashed prices to lure more buyers in face of rising competition and a weak economy. And Netflix is expected to report that it added some 2 million subscribers in the first quarter and investors will scrutinize whether recent price cuts in the launch of an ad-supported plan are tempting people to subscribe and stay on. Bilateral cooperation between Brazil and China is not just restricted to the economic field, but also spread to diverse sectors such as biodiversity protection. Our Ho Jing visited the Chinese Search and Conservation Center in Yichang, Hubei province, to find out how the fish biodiversity protection task is undertaken with joint efforts between China and Brazil. Last month was a busy time in Yichang as scientists, officials, and local residents gathered along the Yangtze River for the annual Chinese sturgeon release event. Chinese sturgeons have a rich history that dates back to over 140 billion years when dinosaurs still existed. The protected sturgeons also caught living fossils, swim to the sea from their river habitat, and spent most of their lifetime here. More than 200,000 Chinese sturgeons will be released three times during this week. All these sturgeons are the second generation of the wild species, ranging from half-year-old to 14 years old. These ones are the smallest ones, uh, and the big ones can be as long as 2 meters of about 100 kilograms. Well, on the early stage of Chinese sturgeon protection, the artificially breeding is basically rely on catching the wild fishes and inducing them to reproduce. The babies of the wild fishes are the first filia generation Chinese sturgeon, and we also call them F1 population. When the F1 individuals get matured, they will give birth to the second filia generation. He Baobing used to be a fisherman for 30 years but he's now a fish protector for the last five years. From catching fish for catering to protecting fish, his work now focuses on increasing the population of fish in rivers. The major task for us was to stop the fishing from being electrocuted. Through constant day and night patrols and vigil, we were able to convert the 63-kilometer-long river that flows through Yichang City as the core protection area for Chinese sturgeons. Not a single fishing line or hook is allowed here. There are also more than 40 Yangtze River porpoises, another endangered species. Now, compared to just three in 2018. And that would do it for this edition of Global Business. Thank you for being with us. Bye for now.
This is CGTN.